Well, hey everyone, it's Mark again, and uh, you just saw that video. This is the third week of our series. Is that really in the Bible? The last two weeks have been amazing, uh, talking about some crazy stories about a tent peg going through someone's head. Last week, Pastor Lindsay talked about a a heavy, overweight king and a sword and a left-handed guy, which as a left-hander myself, I really appreciated that one. If you missed those, uh, I'd encourage you, go back and watch them. They're on our Facebook page, The Valley Church Troy, or our YouTube channel, The Valley Church Troy. you're going to want to see those. Those were really powerful sermons with a lot of application that uh, have, have moved me to respond, and I think they will you too. Well, when I was in college, um, I had a biology professor. His name was Dr. Burkholder. Uh, he was a fitness machine. The guy actually had ran the Columbus Marathon. I would always see him in the weight room, uh, and he was 56 years old at the time, and he was bench pressing and, and holding up his own with about anyone. And uh, just, just an incredibly fit guy. And I remember, I think it was January, if I remember right, getting a phone call one night from a friend that said, Dr. Burkholder just died. He had a massive heart attack. In fact, he was uh, on a bike trip with a bunch of students out west. Um, we're talking massive trails and, and long journeys and uh, wasn't feeling good when they took a break and asked for, I think if I remember right, an orange juice, and by the time the individual came back with a a drink for him, he had passed away. And I got thinking about that as I was reading the text that we're going to look at today, and, you know, I just wondered, you you know, I wonder if he experienced any symptoms, if he had been having any chest pain leading up to that, if, um, if anything had been kind of irregular, out of whack, um, you wonder, did he ignore anything that may be going on or maybe misdiagnosed, thought it was just like acid reflux or, or different things of that nature going on? And it makes you wonder, right, did he know and probably didn't, did he know the true condition of his heart? Had there been a family history of heart disease? Again, a fit guy, just ran the Columbus Marathon, put me to shame as far as physical fitness, and I was 20, 30 years younger than him. Did he know his heart condition? Did he know what was going on? And so I open with that because we're going to be looking at the heart today. But we're going to, before we get to that, we're going to continue with this series of another weird story. It's just a, this is really, I don't think this one is as scary, maybe a little bit, uh, not super gross, if you will, but just just really weird. So if you join in with me, you'll see the verses up on the screen. If you have the Bible in front of you or the Bible app that I highly recommend on your phone, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. It's a short little verse or a couple verses, actually verse 23 to 25. I'm going to read it and you can follow along and I'm going to explain it. It says, from there Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, bald head. They said to him, Get out of here, bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And then he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. Okay. <laughs> you maybe had never heard of that story before. This is like one of those, it's like, what in the world just happened? Like, all right, I believe you, Mark. I think that's in the Bible. It's in my Bible. I'm seeing it. What in the world's going on here? So I want to give you a little bit of background, then kind of explain what's God trying to show us through a very, very, very odd encounter. So Elisha had just become a prophet. His mentor, Elijah, had been taken by a whirlwind up to heaven. Okay, And so he now is in, has big shoes to fill. And he's now just starting his, his ministry. Uh, contextually, this was about 100 years before their northern kingdom, Israel. So at that time, you had a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. And it was about 100 years before the northern kingdom was taken into captivity or fell uh, by, by the Assyrians. Okay? And so that just gives you a little context. They, they, were, they were an evil group in the northern kingdom. Actually, they never had a king, and this would be a good leadership lesson, they never had a king who followed after God. And subsequently, God kept warning them, kept sending prophets, kept saying, you're going to go into captivity, there will be punishment, there will be repercussions if you don't turn to obey me, and they just wouldn't do it. 
And so he's in Bethel. Bethel actually means house of God or house of the Lord, but it was anything but that. The first king of Israel by the name of Jeroboam had established Bethel and another town as the biggest centers of Baal worship, false god worship, the worship Baal and a lot of other sacrificial systems that went against the true God. In fact, he was pretty strategic. He did that because he didn't want them to accidentally slip down to the southern kingdom, to Jerusalem, to discover the really true God, the one true God. And so Bethel, where he is right now, where this all happens, Elisha, is a place known for its depravity, known for its uh, enmity towards God, known for its rebellion. And so that just gives you a little bit of what's going on. The word boys, I just want to address that. It's probably not the best term that the translators used. This same word is used all throughout the Old Testament for all different ages. In fact, sometimes they were grown men. But I know you're going to say, well, yeah, it's pretty bad if they're boys being mauled. It's not a lot better, Mark, <laughs> if grown men are being mauled. And, and, I, and I get that. Just a little bit of what's going on here. So it says they came out, they jeered at him, get out of here, bald head, get out of here, bald head. You're like, what in the world? Like, that's pretty lame. Why would he get, okay? So more than likely, um, baldness, especially from behind, which it sounds like they maybe came out from behind, um, could have been a sign of a, a skin condition. So it could have been that. It was also a term that they used, um, even if a person had a full head of hair, frankly, it was kind of a derogatory term in that first century, uh, or that, that, not first century, but in, in that time in, in human history. So Elisha's walking along, these boys come out, they, they taunt him. In fact, actually, they say to him, um, not only get out of here, but some translations talk about that, just go on up, go on up. In other words, they had seen what happened to Elijah, and they're like, dude, get out of here. We know that you're trying to come and tell us the same thing Elijah did. You're trying to tell us about the one true God. You're trying to tell us about repentance. You're trying to tell us about following after him. Why don't you just disappear like he did? That would be pretty sweet. But they jeer him, they mock him, they, they, they just you know, derive him, or excuse me, just, just beat on him, if you will, as far as verbally. So what's going on? He, turn, he, he curses. Now, he didn't curse them, but he, he curses you know, that to God's, or towards God saying, God, you do, do what you need to do. God, do what needs to happen in this case. Two bears come out and they're mauled. Now, some would say, well, it doesn't say that they killed him when they were mauled. I don't think that's the point. I think a lot of you maybe are like, well, I still struggle with that. Like, even if they were just maimed, I don't really care if they were just maimed or if it was even worse, obviously, if they were killed. So what's going on here? Okay, so I want to just real briefly, you got to understand this was a new generation. It's showing us this is a new generation of people in Bethel uh, uh, for centuries had turned against God. And I really think what's going on here is that God's like, this can't continue. This can't keep on going the way it is. This is unacceptable. You have to turn to me. And I made in my notes here, if you were to summarize this whole encounter in one word or one phrase, God's saying this, I will not be mocked. You're mocking my messenger. You're mocking my prophet. You're mocking the one I put in place. You're mocking me at the same time. Now, I know this kind of goes countercultural in some ways, but we've lost this sight about God. We've lost that God's a holy, perfect God. God cannot tolerate sin. We, we can't say this whole thing of, well, just tolerance. I can do what I want. They can do what they want. Don't tell me what I have to do. I was actually just talking to someone earlier today, and I said, you know, one thing I say a lot is this. There's only one general manager of the universe, and he's God, and he's not me. And God cannot be mocked. And God is perfect and holy. And yes, God is incredibly full, and this is where you can't just take one little verse and make a whole theology out of it, or one little encounter. I've read the Bible many times, cover to cover, and what you see is God is incredibly full of mercy. God is incredibly full of grace. God is incredibly patient. Bible talks about his patience with us is amazing. And I think if we get gut level honest with ourselves, we would say, yeah, he's 
been patient with me. Man, I've been pretty rebellious. Man, I've been pretty following my own way. I've been pretty stubborn. I've been just flat out do what I want to do. But we also have to realize that because he's perfect and holy, he's perfectly just. And there's going to be consequences when we continue to mock him, when we continue to rebel against him, when we continue to go our own way, when we continue to do whatever we want to do. He's not as a perfect and holy God who's madly in love with his creation, you know, as a good dad or as a good mom, you're not going to let your kids continue to do the wrong thing over and over again. There has to be consequences. There has to be some type of discipline so that they turn to the right way. And that's what God's always doing. He's trying to get us to come back to him. So I opened up today talking about my biology professor who passed away of a heart attack. And I asked some questions about symptoms, right, and knowing if these things are going on. And I was really talking about the the muscle of the heart. But I don't want to continue talking about the muscle of the heart today. I want to talk about the other heart. What other heart? The heart that's our core. The heart that is our the true you and the true me. Uh, Really, the heart that defines who we really are. Proverbs 4.23 tells us this, above all else, above everything, focus on this, focus on this, nothing else is compared, guard your heart. Why? Because it is the wellspring of life. In other words, everything that comes out of our inner core says about who we are. And and God says, guard that thing like none other. Guard that, guard that, guard that, because when it's tainted, when it's impure, when it it mocks God, and you say, oh, that Mark, I don't mock God. I would never, okay, really? I know I have. I've rebelled against what he wants me to do. I've gone my own way. I've done whatever I want to do in the moment. I don't consult him every time about what I'm supposed to do. Is that not mocking him? I think it frankly is. Everything flows out of our heart. Everything flows out of our heart. In other words, it dictates our relationships, how we parent, how we relate to others, how we react, and how we love. In fact, from God's perspective, get this folks, from God's perspective, there's nothing more important to him than the condition of our heart. Again, not the muscle, but who we are, the inner core of who we are. That's what's so important to God. That's what's so on his mind, so desperate to him. Sometimes we see symptoms of our heart, don't we? Symptoms can include dissatisfaction, boredom, maybe a seed of anger that's growing within you, consuming lust, unresolved hurt, a desire to hurt others back, becoming more self-absorbed, Envy. We, we see these symptoms kind of brewing up of a heart that's not where it's supposed to be. I don't know about you, but sometimes then we soothe those or we mask those things. We soothe them by distractions, by doing other things to not really deal with the true core issues. We mask them. We put on a fake kind of veneer, act like everything's okay show up at church, show up online, show up in your sacred space wherever you are. But the inner core condition's not doing too well. We self-medicate. Sometimes we just buy things, right? Sometimes we just distract ourselves by getting that new boat, getting this new toy, getting these new shoes, whatever the case might be, to kind of distract us from really dealing with the issues deep within See, this heart issue, this heart condition that's going on with these 42 men who mocked Elisha have been going on since the very beginning. And actually in Genesis chapter 6, he says this, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. How bad had it become? Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. We see right here from the beginning that the problem always lies within. It's an internal problem. We want to deal so often with the external 
behaviors, if you will, or the external evidences. But the, the problem, the root core issue, is an internal issue that you and I deal with. It's a heart problem. In other words, our spiritual arteries are blocked. Have you ever thought about that? Are your spiritual arteries blocked today? What have you allowed to get in that's penetrated into the arteries that lead into your heart or away from your heart that's impeded your relationship with Jesus? Is it pride? Is it envy? Is it apathy? Is it you know, prestige? Is it power? Is it influence? Is it just, ah, you don't really care? Like, whatever. What is blocking our hearts today? See, sin infects every part of our lives. It, it's the issue. It's kind of like snake venom, right? It's a snake venom. Sin, you could equate to like a snake venom going towards our heart. Have you ever caught yourself? I've, I've, I've had this happen to myself. I'll say something, and I'm like, I can't believe I just said that. Like, that's not me. I don't know where that came from. Or we do something. I know I have. You do something, and after you do whatever you did, you're like, man, where, why would I ever do that? I, I don't even like when other people do that. Like, those are things I call other people out on. Those are, people, those are things that other people should be judged for. But yet I just did it myself. Have you ever been there? I know I have a little way too often. But then we kind of like say, well, that wasn't me, right? Um, that was just a slip up, you know. You know, Come on, man. No, Mark, no one's perfect, right? Well, I'm going to give us a diagnosis today. And sometimes we get diagnoses that we don't want to hear, right? But we need to hear them. Because if we don't face the brutal facts, we're never going to get better, right? It's like someone just pretending they're in perfect health. Even though the test results come back and they're terrible, they just like, eh, the machine was wrong. Ah, tested another day. I had some chips before this one. I, you know, if I get, no, let's, let's really lean into this. See, here's the diagnosis. The problem, the problem with the world, our world, your world, my world, is that we're completely out of sync with God's heart. In other words, we have heart damage. I said it this way, you'll see it. We have a heart problem. And here's the reality, folks. It's a lot deeper than a behavior problem. So often we just want to focus on the behaviors. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. I, I feel that's when things get kind of into religion instead of relationship. We see all throughout the scripture that God is desperately wanting to capture our hearts. Why? Because the internal, everything always starts internally. And then it manifests itself externally. Bible says, out of the heart comes everything. Okay? Our mind, it originates in our mind. And so we have to realize that when we say something and say, oh, I can't believe it. I would never say that. Well, you just said it. I just said it. And that does reflect my heart. It wasn't a slip up. It was a heart issue. It's not a fatal thing necessarily if I, if I deal with it, but I have to acknowledge it was a heart problem. He goes on in Genesis chapter 6 and he says, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. Can you imagine that? The creator of the universe in the Hebrew is such a vivid language and such an emotional language. God is filled with pain. Just let that sink in. It says his heart is filled with pain with pain. He's distraught. He's, he's just so bent out of shape of looking at humanity he's created whose hearts have rebelled against his heart. Why? Because when sin entered the world, we got out of sync with God's heart. We substituted so many other things and we started essentially mocking God. And when we do that, there has to be consequences if we don't repent, if we don't confess, which means to acknowledge that God is right. A man walks into a doctor's office one day 
And they ask him what he's there for. He says, I got shingles. So the lady's like, well, sit down. Here's a medical form. I want you to fill all this out, history, your insurance, all that stuff, and then give it back to me. So he fills it all out, gives it back to him. And then about 15 minutes later, a nurse's aide comes and ushers him in to a room. And, and she asks him, what are you here for? And he says, I got, I got shingles. And so she takes down his weight, takes down his height, blood pressure, medical history. And then she says, well, change into this gown and the next, the nurse will be here in a few minutes to take some of your vitals and some of those other things. So about a half hour later, a nurse comes in and says, sir, what brings you in today? And he says, I got shingles. And so she runs a battery of tests. I mean, blood tests, blood pressure tests, electrocardiogram. And she says, just wait for the doctor. The doctor should be in pretty shortly to help you. About an hour later, we've all been to the doctor, we know how that kind of goes. About an hour later, the doctor came in and he asked the man, what brings you in today? And he says, what, or what is your condition? And he said, shingles. And so the doctor gives him a full body exam. There's nothing left unexplored, checks him thoroughly. He can't find shingles anywhere. And he asked the guy, what's going on? Where is this? Where are the shingles? And the man replies, well, they're outside in the truck. Where do you want them? See, we can easily misdiagnose a problem. That guy came there today to the doctor because he had a delivery of shingles. <laughs> he didn't have a shingles health issue. It's so easy to misdiagnose problems. You see, our heart, and I think the sooner we recognize this, the better off we'll be, our heart's corrupt, it's sick, it's damaged, and it's inclined to be selfish, prideful, sinful, and heartbreaking to God. I was sharing with a group of guys that I meet with every Saturday morning. We just talk, do accountability. We're growing together as leaders. We read books together. Uh, we're working on our life purpose statement for the season of life. It's just iron sharpening iron growing together. And I, I don't know, for whatever reason, last week I was just saying to him, I said, I've been reflecting a lot. And just saying, you know, are, are my motives pure? If God asked me to do something and I, in my mind, came up with something pretty big, I was like, would I do it? It's easy to say, yeah, I would do it. Yeah, because the Bible says, because I'm following Jesus. But I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever created these hypotheticals in your mind that are like stretching you really far. Like what if God asked you to give away a certain amount of your, your resources? What if he asked you to leave your career? What if he, right? Things that are not, and I'm talking about, like you got to play in your mind like this is really happening. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one who, who does this. I don't know. But I had this like sense that like, I don't know if I'm going to be honest. I could give the Sunday school answer, if you will. I could give the pastor answer. But how about we give the gut level honest answer? I said, guys, I don't know if my motives are as pure as they need to be. I don't know if my commitment to Christ and to do whatever he asks me to do, right? Because we see in the New Testament, it's very clear, right? He says, pick up your cross. In other words, be willing to die for me. Am I really there yet? And I had to say, I don't think I am. I think that my heart's still not where it needs to be. I think there's still pride. I think there's still selfish desire. I think there's still comfort going on in there. And I think I learned this, and you'll see it on your screen, that my heart condition is untreatable. I don't need heart surgery. I need a heart transplant. I need God to change my heart. And now here's the beauty about this. Because I told you earlier that he's so madly in love with you, and because he so desperately wants to bring that miracle into your life, he so desperately wants us to be in sync with his father's heart, because the text we looked at today breaks his heart. It was generation, folks, it was generation after generation after generation who had mocked God, who had rebelled against him, and subsequently rebelled against anyone who was representing him. In this case, Elijah was the easy target. 
And eventually God says, I can't, the pot pie, if you will, with the pipe spinning in his mouth, I can't stand it no more. I've given you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to receive a new heart. Why do you keep rejecting me? I love this passage in Ezekiel 36. Man, the imagery, the vividness is so awesome. I will sprinkle you clean. This is from the prophet Ezekiel speaking God's words to the people. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Anyone just need that? Man, we could just stop there. Anyone just need clean water to be sprinkled on you? To know that God wants to get rid of the muck and the dirt and the junk in your life. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. And get this, I will give you a new heart. What a promise, right? And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He says three things right here. He said, I will give you a new heart. I will cleanse your sin away. And then, top that all off, I will give you the Holy Spirit. It's a prophecy. I will give you the Holy Spirit so you have the power to be victorious. So that that heart can stay cleansed. So that heart can stay pure. So those motives can have purity to them because of a clean heart heart. In other words, he's saying, I will give you the Holy Spirit to change your desires. It won't be selfish desires. It will be selfless. It won't be desires for self-promotion. It will be desires to edify other people. It won't be desires to consume as much as you can. It will be desires to give away as much as you can. It won't be desires to keep your faith and not share with anyone. It will be desires through the Holy Spirit to share it with other people who are hurting, who are lost, who have hearts of stone and will someday face the perfect and holy God and his judgment will be, depart from me, I never knew you. We have our responsibility. So here's my question as we wrap up today. Do you want a new heart? You have to ask yourself that question, not just flippantly, but seriously. Do you really want a new heart? Now, here's the encouraging news. You can receive a new heart today. God is in the business of heart transplants. God is in the business of changing us from the inside out. God is in the business of getting our hearts in sync with his hearts. In a few moments, we're going to, the hosts are actually going to give you a link to a song. This song is incredible and awesome and any other great adjective I can come up with. It's by the band Sidewalk Prophets. It's called Come to the Table. The lyrics on this song are incredibly powerful, but before I get to that, I want to do a call to community. I know so many of you watching today are isolated, but you're joining us. You don't have much community in your life. You need other people. I want to challenge you with these, this question. Who do you have in your life who really knows your heart? I ask that because of what you see underneath that. Because in community, we can guard each other's hearts. I feel that some of you need to be like Joshua when he got to the Jordan River. You just need to get your feet a little bit wet. And that feet, and then God will do the rest. You need today to get into one of our groups. We have a bunch of groups that meet online. Your hosts are going to talk to you right now about those. They'll probably even send you a link to our website with those. They'll tell you how to access them through our app. We have many groups. Some of our hosts that are hosting now have their own groups. If we don't have enough groups, we will start a new group for you to get into because you matter so much to us. And because without other people checking in on our hearts and helping us guard our hearts, I don't mean to sound fatalistic, but we really don't stand a chance. Because our hearts on our own, we're so inclined 
towards selfishness, towards shifting away from what God's desires are. So if they haven't already, your hosts are going to put that video link in there. And I hope you've been interacting with our hosts as we've been going today. If you have prayer requests, if you want to make a decision for Jesus today, let them know. Don't walk out of here today without making a decision. There's a number they'll post up there. It's 937-358-6565. You can text the word new. You can text, that comes directly to me. You can text me directly. But that song, you don't have to listen to it right now, but maybe after we finish here in a couple minutes, you listen to it. And let the words soak in that all of us come to God's table, that all of us are invited into God's presence, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter the shame that we walk in there with, God wants to wipe that shame away. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring restoration. He wants to bring reconciliation. He wants to bring redemption. And he wants to bring forgiveness. And maybe like you, or excuse me, maybe like me, you're going to take and put that song on your Spotify playlist or whatever. I will literally listen to it three or four times when I'm at the weight room each week. <laughs> Different song to listen to while you're bench pressing. But I just, that just God's words keep soaking into my head through the lyrics of that song. Well, before we wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I'm going to pray that you would say yes to Jesus today, that you would turn away from the heart of stone and receive the heart of flesh, that you would stop mocking God, you would stop rebelling against him, that you would stop turning away from him, and that today would be the day that you give your life to him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray for those listening and watching right now. God, I pray that you would speak to us. You tell us your spirit will search us. Psalm 139 tells us, and find out if there's anything offensive. God, if there's anyone listening today who's never given their life to your son, Jesus Christ, They've been mocking God in the sense that they've been rebelling against him. They've been living life the way they want to do it. God, I pray today would be the day that they say yes to Jesus. They would confess their sin. Confess literally means to acknowledge that God is right and that sin broke their relationship with a perfect and holy God. And they would realize, as Scripture tells us, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God is faithful and just, here's the good news, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you need that cleansing today? The cleansing that's talked about here in Ezekiel, the cleansing that he can only bring. Would you say yes to Jesus today? Would you let one of our hosts know that you said yes to Jesus today? Don't leave today without making that decision. Your tomorrow is not guaranteed. Would you receive the heart of flesh? God, thank you for speaking to us through a story that seems kind of crazy, that seems like you're out to get us, but is anything from that because you're wanting to reveal yourself to all humanity so that we turn from our sin and live a life for you with a new heart. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.